Coming up on Medical Minutes here on Time Warner Cable DMG TV2, we talk about autistic children and the play project through the Tuscarawas County Board of Developmental Disabilities. Carrie Klein is here to explain it. We'll also talk with Lou Ann Beavers Willis. She's the diabetes educator from Trinity Hospital Twin City on recognizing your risk factors. Then we take a trip to Kent State Tuscarawas and learn all about the Associate Degree Nursing Program from its director, Joan Lappett. Join us on Medical Minutes. A nursing home or your own home? It's good to be home, so call Ember Complete Care for all your home health needs. When you're recovering from illness or injury, our compassionate staff promotes healing in the most comfortable environment of all, your own home. For skilled nursing, physical therapy, wound care, and more. Locally owned and operated, Ember Complete Care has been servicing all of Tuscaroras and Coshocton County since 1986, with a yearly average of $75,000 donated back into the community. Call 1-800-462-0909. Ember Complete Care. It's good to be home. Myers & Miller Podiatry provides complete foot and ankle care to patients of all ages. The practice was established in 2000 by Dr. Adam Myers and has grown to include Dr. Andy Miller in 2007 and most recently Dr. Jason Backage in 2010. Our core values of respect and honesty are the basis for how we manage our practice and we have grown by building relationships with our patients in order to better serve their needs. Myers & Miller Podiatry serves Tuscaroras and Holmes County with offices in Dover, Sugar Creek, Newcomerstown, and Millersburg. Let's get started building our relationship. Welcome to Medical Minutes here on Time Warner Cable DMG TV 2. Today we are going to be talking about autism with Carrie Klein. She is an early intervention specialist with the Tuscarawas County Board of Developmental Disabilities. Welcome, Carrie. Oh, thanks for having me. So we've heard about autism all over the place, but really, what is autism? What does that mean? It is a range of disorders um, that is characterized by um, some deficits or some difficulties with social interaction, uh, difficulty with communication back and forth, as well as uh, repetitive behaviors in children. So when I'm adults. thinking of autism, I'm thinking of the movie Rain Man, or I'm thinking of where you know children, like you said, repetitive actions where they're maybe spinning a plate and watching it spin, mm -hmm. but not communicating with anyone mm -hmm. else around them. Is that the most severe form? Uh, yes, um, what you'll see is a lot of times children diagnosed with autism, they kind of are in their own little world. They're very object oriented. They like, they're focused on maybe a toy versus us as people, they love toys. They may be fixated on something of the toy. So maybe a wheel. And again, the spinning motion, just fixated on things being lined up, being in a particular order. Um, like I said, they're just very much into themselves, into interacting with things, how they um, are comfortable. So, and there's different levels of severity. Yes, yes. Um, there's a range. There's mild um, developmental delays associated with it, or there's more severe um, that really impedes uh, development and those sorts of things. Now, I've heard of Asperger's syndrome. What is that? Um, Asperger's syndrome. Asperger syndrome is actually what we would refer to as high functioning autism. Um, you'll see a lot of the characteristics of autism. Again, they have specific interests that they enjoy. They like to talk about um, themselves or what they're interested in. Also, you'll notice that um, they can communicate, but they have difficulty with gestures. How I'm using my hands and I'm saying things in different tones, a lot of times their communication difficulties um, they're very monotone or robotic in how they communicate back and forth with people. And how do you know if you should have your child tested? Um, there's a lot of warning signs. Um, one of the key, key things is um, if they're missing developmental milestones. So let's say your six month old isn't smiling. It's kind of not interacting back and forth with you. So that's kind of a beginning sign that says, hey, they're kind of in their own world. They're in tune with themselves. So at six months old, you can figure this out. Well, it builds on that at nine months. If they're not going back and forth, um, again, if you smile, 
Does your baby smile back? And then it just progresses to um, when they're 12 months old and they're not able to communicate at all. If you point to something, they're not looking, they're not responding to their name. Um, it, and sometimes, a lot of times, it's really obvious about a year and a half when there's no language. And there's a lot of frustration, um, difficulty with change, and those sorts of things happen. And so you, as an early intervention specialist, have something called the Play Project. Yes. What, what's the Play, <laughs> what's play Project? Yes, I attended a training um, last fall. And the Play Project is an intensive um, intervention program. It's a home-based program where I, as the consultant, would go into the home. Um, the main purpose of play is for parents to be the best play partner for their child. So what I do... So they go in and play with your kid. Yes. Well, I that's just, easy enough. <laughs> well, it, it's a little more tricky than you would think. Um, there's a lot of cues that, you know, you have to pick up on with children with, you know, who are diagnosed with autism. So you just kind of have to tune into them. And sometimes that's tricky um, to figure out um, ways to be with them and then to build yourself into their play so that, again, they're focused not just on the toy, they want you there too. And so that's really the key concept of what we try to do in play is that we want those interactions to facilitate with you know, specific strategies that we do. So how many kids are you working with at one um, time? <laughs> well, often, I mean, it's a family approach. Sometimes siblings are there. Uh, right now, I have one family that, that I'm doing the play project with um, throughout the county. But So we're trying to outreach to other families. Um, since I am early intervention, I work birth to age three. So that's the age that we're kind of focusing the play project on at this time. So basically, you know, Sometimes siblings are there, that's okay. So we just try to include those meaningful people that the child interacts with every day into our sessions and so that we can build the relationships and the interactions. And are you seeing progress? Yes, yes, with this child that yes, we have seen progress. So it's, it's pretty cool. That's good, yeah, that's <laughs> It's gotta... pretty cool, I mean, I mean, we went from someone that was very nonverbal to babbly trying to, to communicate more. And again, just recognizing the fact that there were, we're in the room with with them. So, you know, there's a lot of power in, in the play project that I've seen so far. And let me ask you about the number of children diagnosed with autism, no matter what the severity. Mm -hmm. It seems to be on the rise. Is that because we have better tools or is it because of an immunization? There are so many different yeah. theories. What, what causes this explosion in okay, autism? I think that we, firstly, we know a lot more. Um, we're understanding the characteristics, we're understanding the, the warning signs, and we now understand that it's a range. That we have mild disabilities, you know, mild associations, and then we have the severe. So I think that, you know, now we have more awareness. So that kind of contributes to the fact that there's more diagnosis. So. And as far as immunizations go, that, that hasn't no, been it, proven. No, that hasn't been proven. Um, actually, um, there's been numerous studies. Uh, a lot of them thought that it was the mumps and rubella vaccine that was causing, but it correlates with the time period where the characteristics show up. But there is no correlation that, that has been proven um, that vaccinations cause it. But that's something that if you have you know, autism um, disorders in your family, you are predisposed position to getting it again. So it is more of a genetic, biological thing versus um, the vaccination. Is there anything in the environment that could trigger that gene mm -hmm. to? Yeah, it, it's not just having the gene that's mutated. A lot of times there's environmental factors that feed into it. So the things kind of work hand in hand. So it can be something that happened during delivery um, where there was lack of oxygen to the brain. It could be that the mother was exposed to something during her pregnancy that maybe she was really sick. It could be just the age of the parents at conception. So there's all different kinds of environmental factors that can encourage, I guess you could say, that gene to pop in children. But as you said, the, the awareness and the different treatments that are available mm -hmm. and the play project that we're doing <laughs> here, uh, there, there's a lot of things that you can do. Yes, I mean, and, and that's the thing. The first thing that you need to do if you suspect that your child would um, possibly show signs of autism, and the first thing that you need to do is tell your doctor. So go to the pediatrician, say, I'm noticing, you know, they're not talking like they should be. They're not interacting with me. That's the first step. Um, also, as an early intervention specialist, uh, we work closely with Help Me Grow. So you can 
phone them anytime you would have any concerns with your child's development. We're happy to come out to you. We're home-based. So we come to you, we complete evaluation, and we can see where your child is. And we can help you through the process if you feel that you need further assessment too. All good to know. <laughs> well, Carrie Klein, an early intervention specialist with the Tuscarawas County Board of Developmental Disabilities, thanks for being oh, on Medical Minutes. <laughs>
there's a way to check on your own to see if you have any of these risk factors, and that's right online, right? Yes, it is, Jennifer. It's on the American Diabetes Association website, which is www.americandiabetesassociation. And there is a very simple seven question self test that you can take to determine if you have the risk factors for diabetes. You know, some of the questions are, what is your age? Are you male or female? What about um, family members who have diabetes? What is your weight? What is your activity level? And I would encourage everyone to go online and do that self-test. And there are some guidelines at the bottom of the form that if you have a total score, I believe it is, um, let me double check here. If your total score is five or higher, when you answer those seven questions, because there's a numerical value assigned for each question, then that means that you are at risk for prediabetes or diabetes. And you need to share that information with whoever is your healthcare provider, because that individual then can determine what other additional diagnostic testing that you may need um, to be screened for diabetes or prediabetes. And there are two types of diabetes, right? Well, actually, there are many types. You know, I think a type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but gestational diabetes as well. Right. What, what are the types of diabetes? Type 1 diabetes typically affects um, anyone from infancy through young adulthood. And that is usually a very sudden onset where um, possibly there's some kind of virus that has attack, attacked the pancreas, which is the body organ that makes insulin. And insulin drives the breakdown of carbohydrates, which is sugar, from the blood into the cells so they can be used as fuel. And what ends up happening is if the pancreas stops making insulin, this individual with type 1 diabetes then has to be managed with insulin daily. And those are the shots? Those are the shots or the injections of insulin. Occasionally you'll find a individual maybe late um, young adulthood or into early adulthood that is diagnosed with type 1, but usually it's anyone from infancy through those young adult years. Type 2 diabetes is by far the most common type of diabetes in our country today. In fact, some statistics tell us that 8.3% of the U.S. population has type 2 diabetes. And we're talking about a significant number of people, 25.8 million people. Start out where two things are happening in their body. One is their pancreas is starting to slow down with insulin production. I almost that just comes with age. It comes with maturing in age and that pancreas being stressed over time where people eat large amounts of carbohydrates or they go for long periods of time not eating and you know maybe they eat one meal a day and then their pancreas um, has to respond to a lot of extra sugar that your liver makes when you fast for a long period of time. Um, the other thing that goes on with type 2 diabetes is the insulin your pancreas is making, your body is not using it very efficiently. We say that you have insulin resistance. It's like it just doesn't work as well for you as it did maybe when you were younger. And so those individuals then usually have to be managed with medication. It could be oral medication. It could be insulin, healthy eating, being physically active, losing weight. And do you find locally, do, do people understand how to make sure that they are, don't have these risk factors and to pay attention to it? You know, you're a diabetes educator. Are most people listening to you? Do they hear you? People are listening to me, and I, I think we're so very fortunate that Trinity Hospital Twin City, um, about 15 months ago, wrote a grant application for a rural health grant to really get the message out there to Tuscarawas County, 
Southern Carroll County, and Harrison County. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, that we wanted to not only provide education for people who have diabetes, but we also want to get out in the community and make people aware of pre-diabetes and risk factors for diabetes and get them on board with some healthy lifestyle changes. All right, so if you have any questions at all, you can always contact Luanna at Trinity Hospital. She is the diabetes educator. And for Medical Minutes, I'm Jennifer Clark, but stay tuned, we're going to Kent State when we come back. We live in a fast-paced world. Say goodbye to searching books and search engines for all the answers. Now there's iTowns. From finding a place to dine or locating your family doctor, you can also check out the high school game of the week from TV2 Sports. Get your answer with just one click. iTowns has it all. For chronic sinusitis sufferers, the idea of going to the hospital for invasive surgery may deter them from getting help. But thanks to Dr. Kurt Guerin, ENT, those days are over. Dr. Guerin is the first ear, nose, and throat specialist in Northeast Ohio to regularly offer balloon sinuplasty right in the comfort of his own office in Dover. Welcome back to Medical Minutes here on Time Warner Cable DMG TV2. And we are in a lab at Kent State University, Tuscarawas. We are talking with Joan Lappin. She is the Director of Associate Degree Nursing. Joan, welcome to Medical Minutes. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you today. So when we say Associate Degree Nursing, wh what is that degree? The Associate Degree Nursing is a two-year program. Many students take three years to complete it. At the end of that, those students are prepared to go out and take care of patients in the hospital, the extended care. They can go into home health, hospice. There's lots of opportunities for those students to pick the career that they would like to go into. Um, we also then tell the students that when they come in, nursing is long life learning. So we do encourage them to go on and get their bachelor's degree and we have the RN to BSN completion program here on this campus that they can come in and complete their bachelor's as well. Typically if you go for your bachelor's as your initial degree, it's a four to possibly five year program and for our students in this area they really need to get out and be able to earn an income to support themselves and their families so the associate degree program is a good option for them. So it's a good way to, to get started. Do most hospitals and doctor's offices and things that you can use your RN, do they require the bachelor's later? Um, they are, there's a big push now to go on for your bachelor's degree and the hospitals are really pushing for that and encouraging their nurses upon hire to say, please, you know, you have your associates, but we'd like you to go on. But in the extended care, physicians offices, some of those are not as particular about having the bachelors, although they always support additional education, which is important. So how many students do you enroll every year? Every year we take in 80 students and we always fill all of our seats so we're at capacity every fall and then in the second level we run 70 to um, 60 to 70 students there because there will be some students that will get into the program and find out that nursing just is not the field that they thought it was and it's best to choose to go for another career option at that time. But nursing is extremely popular in this area. Why is that? It's very popular for many th reasons. It's very versatile, so you can pick many different career paths with it. It also is a degree that will allow you to go out and earn an income where you can support yourself and your family. It's flexibility now with the 12-hour shifts. You can work three days a week and have four days off or which allows you more time at home where you can do something else at that time. And it's also a very rewarding career too. It lets you 
do whatever you want. You can come back and get more education, go into management. Um, you could be a nurse practitioner, which is an advanced practice nurse, which is becoming very popular, and the physician's offices are using a lot of advanced nurse practitioners. So it's just an opportunity to explore wherever you want to go. And you can also go into education. That's where I'm at. We have a lot of nurses that are here as faculty that like to teach it, so there's that opportunity as well. And uh, back in the day when my mom was in nursing, it was mostly women. Yes, it was, and now that is changing. We have approximately 15 to 20% of our student population is male nurses. And I believe there's just that change that the profession of nursing is open to males and females where back 30 years ago, tells my age, but back then, um, there we were had one or two students in my class at that time and that was very rare to find men in nursing but now it's a viable career option men are seeking it they're being very successful and so that is an area that I really anticipate will continue to grow and uh, what about as a second career many people start out with something maybe they don't like and they they keep leaning towards nursing did, did they come back a lot yes they do a lot of uh, students are here as a second career choice. Men more than maybe some of the females, but it's kind of equal each way. They've been displaced and they see this as an option for them. And in healthcare, the nursing positions are very stable jobs. And as far as where we are right now, we're in a, a lab. It, it looks like a real hospital. Yes, this is our uh, skills nursing lab. The first level students spend numerous hours here because that first level is where we teach them the skills that they need to go out and provide care to the patients. And then they also need to practice that skill before they go out and provide that to the patient. So as you can see here, we have very a lot of mannequins in here. This, this lady Yeah, these right are not here, real people that you no, see. These are all mannequins. Um, the lady here, she is simulating our like birthing suite. We have one of those here, but we have obstetrics, so that encourages, excuse me, it involves labor and delivery. So this mother, it, she's already delivered her baby, but we take them through that process and we have numerous mannequins that the students can use. Some of them, we have a very high fidelity mannequin called Sim Man. He will actually talk to you and he breathes and he coughs and he makes all kinds of wonderful sounds that are appropriate for nursing. And then we have the mid-fidelity mannequins that the students can listen to bowel sounds and lung sounds, but they don't talk, but they give you that opportunity to practice so that when you go out and hear these with your patients, you can say, oh yeah, that's what that sounds like. And all of the equipment, is it all working equipment too? Yes, everything's working. The only thing that we simulate here is we do have oxygen, but it's only air. So when you turn on the oxygen, they're only getting air just because we don't need to deal with all of the compliance things that you need to have oxygen. But the blood pressure cups, the otoscopes, the ophthalmoscopes, all of those are fully functioning. The students can utilize those. They're at every at the top of every bed, we have suction, we have call lights, everything so that it can simulate that hospital or extended care experience. And when your graduates come back, they say, hey, everything was exactly the way you taught me. Yes, we do do surveys of our graduates and they, the satisfaction with our education here is very high. We also do surveys of the employers of our graduates and they're very satisfied with the quality of the nurse that is produced here at Kent State Tuscarawas. Fantastic. The director of associate degree nursing, Joan Lappin, here on Medical Minutes. And for DMG TV2, I'm Jennifer Clark.